Hey, welcome back to Curiosity Hub, I'm Ollie Hubbard. It turns out plants can tell when they're being eaten. They can even tell the specific insect which is eating them by the insect's saliva and any digestive chemicals that come up while it's munching away. So a large white butterfly comes and lands on a cabbage. It lays its eggs and then the larvae hatch out of the eggs and start to munch away on the cabbage. But the beta-glucosidase in the larvae spit tips off the cabbage and it releases a volatile cocktail of organic compounds and they're calling a specific parasitic wasp. And this wasp almost exclusively uses this species of caterpillar. So how does this wasp use the caterpillars? Well, the wasp flies in and lays its own eggs inside the caterpillar larvae. Within 15 to 20 days, they hatch and then they eat their way out of the caterpillar. And then they'll make their own cocoons nearby and after about a week, they'll hatch as adult wasps. But this plant has therefore changed a herbivorous threat into a carnivorous visitor who will then go on to make more generations of caterpillar baby-eating wasps. So, it's a pretty clever move by the plant. But sometimes the caterpillar babies don't even get to hatch because we've found that some plants can even identify the fluid which is released when the eggs are laid. So for example, if our friend the white butterfly comes and lands on Brussels sprouts, there's a chemical on the Brussels sprouts which changes and attracts a different parasitic wasp, which then flies in and lays its own eggs in the eggs of the caterpillars. And so they don't even ever hatch. It's the wasp larvae which come out. So it's like wasps and Brussels sprouts working together. It's, an, it's a nightmare. I used to think that I was anaphylactic to wasps until I got stung. But they still freak me out. Peas also react to this fluid as it can alter some of the cell's gene expression really quickly. So basically it results in tumor-like growths growing around the pod so that when the larvae hatch they can't burrow in and eat it out. But all of this results in an arms race because some insect saliva can actually inhibit the defense response of the plants. But then another strategy by the plants is rather than use these assassins who they call in, they can keep personal armies on site. For example, the bird cherry tree has leaves which secrete nectar, which is just like the sweet juice found in most flowers. But that nectar is a reliable food source for the ants, which can then make the tree their home and protect their home against insects and caterpillars. But the acacia tree has ants as well, and they don't just protect it against small things, they can protect the tree against giraffes and elephants. Acacias also provide homes for their ant armies. Domartia, from the Latin domus, meaning home, refers to small little chambers built in to the plant structure, and they're there to house tiny little arthropods. For acacias, that's mainly the inside hollow part of their spines. But one amazing example is the Myromacodia. So it's an epiphyte, so it doesn't grow in the soil, it grows up in the air. And it has these bulbous stems full of these empty, just hollow chambers, the perfect place for an ant colony. So rather than getting its nutrients from the soil, it gets its nutrients from the debris left by the ant colony. And ants can even attack other plants. So in the Amazon rainforest, we found these small little pockets of surprisingly low biodiversity. We didn't really know what was going on until finally we realized it was ants poisoning the leaves of any little shoots or stems coming up that weren't the species which was providing for them. So up until now, plants have kind of seemed like the ultimate mafia bosses. They're wiping out all of their enemies but keeping their hands completely clean. So let's look at a crime scene which changes all of that. It's the middle of a harsh dry season in South Africa and kudus are dying in large numbers. So kudus are basically a species of antelope and they're a pretty big animal. So the first suspect is illegal hunters. Although the only problem is that kudus in in fenced areas 
that should be safe from poachers are actually dying in the largest numbers. And when we look at their dead bodies, there are no bullets anywhere. The second suspect was a virus, but they had a look at the dead kudu's body and they couldn't really find any trace. So finally, Volta van Hoven from the University of Pretoria cut open the stomach of a kudu. And there, caught red-handed, were acacia leaves. So these leaves usually have tannin inside them, but not enough to kill a kudu. But the excessive dryness meant that the trees were under a lot of stress. And then in fenced in areas where there was over foraging, the trees were even more stressed. And so in response to that, they'd increased the tannin concentration in their leaves hugely. And they'd increased it so much so that when the kudu ate the tannin filled leaves, it was enough to denature the enzymes in the kudu's liver. And so ultimately the kudus were poisoned and died within two weeks. But the real problem arose from the acacia trees communicating. So when a kudu came and ate an acacia tree, it let off ethylene in about a 50 meter radius from it. And then all those trees around it boosted the tannin levels in their leaves as well, and then spread that signal on. So wherever the poor kudu went, there seemed to be poisonous leaves everywhere. Now, trees communicating above ground is actually just the tip of the iceberg. So next week we'll be delving below ground and looking at how a web of fungi and roots creates a sharing and talking community. And so subscribe if you want to catch that. Uh, last week I said we'll be getting into plant communication. So a little bit this week, but we'll really be getting into it next week. And uh, with that, I just also wanted to say thank you for all of those uh, people out there who tune in every week and are hopefully learning something, but also just enjoying all of this crazy stuff. Uh, so feel free to check out the links, comment as always, um, ask any questions. And also liking and sharing this video really does help me spread what I'm doing. But you guys are smart people. You can do whatever you like. So thanks so much. Uh, have a good one and I'll see you next week. Thanks apes. So kudus are basically a species of antelope and they're antelope, 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 antelope.